Boy Gotham, a crazy podcast about DC, with your host E-Rock and PD. When we speak up, get your geeks up, cause you know you about to get geeked up. So sit back, relax, and get comfy. Lose your mind like Solomon Grundy, and listen to a show that won't be forgotten. Coming straight out of Gotham. And hello, everybody out in Corto Maltese. Welcome to another episode of Straight Out of Gotham, episode 48, the Anthony Rizzo episode. We are a fandom pop culture podcast and a proud member of the Batman Podcast Network, hosted by Batman on Film. Make sure you check out all the other great shows on the network by heading on over to batmanpodcastnetwork.com. Uh, tons of great shows. It's literally a buffet of just fabulous things. Gotham Outsiders, uh, Batman Book Club, ELTD, Comics for Junkies, uh, the BOF Satellite Show, which uh, we will have. Uh, that's a new show in the network, The Dramatic Return of uh, Ricky Joe Shoe, a.k.a. The Old Dick Shoes. I am your co-host from the other side of the Hudson River, a uh, proud pizza eater and a senior contributor to Batman on Film. I'm Peter M. Vera. Today we are recording on August 9th, 2021. And as always, we have a fantastic show for you today. But before we get into the good stuff, I'd like to remind you, all of our faithful listeners, that if you take the time to rate and review our show on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, and we read that review on air, you automatically enter in, uh, you automatically win our uh, monthly contest. Uh, You know, all you got to do is review the show, good or bad. If it's it's funny, we'll read it. If it's rough, we'll read it. Uh, Put some effort into it. Hate mail is always appreciated as much as fan mail. Now, let me introduce uh, my partner in crime, the headliner for Long Island Survivor, taking place on Plum Island next summer. Ladies and gentlemen, a fellow Batman on film contributor and the champion of Long Island, Eric Holzman. Hello there, Peter. Eric, how are you? I'm good. Yeah, that news was just that you see. You're... Everyone knows you know like me Omar. because, that, yes, that, that Survivor news was was literally just happened. So. Because you know me, you're kind of the insider and you can break my... I'm your publicist. Yes, you can break the news to people. <laughs> you can break the news to people. And uh, yeah, so that should be fun. I'm looking forward to it. Um, I'm usually not big on these shows, but when people are like, yo, we need to get the champion of Long Island, I was like, all right. Well, if it's on Plum right. Island, you've got to represent. Yeah, so here I am doing that. But that's not till next summer, so I have time to get my body in shape. Because trust me, that's I have you, to do please. That. You're you're in total jock form. That no, I'm not. I wish I was, but that's not the case. So <laughs> so sad. I know. So what's going on, man? How you been since we last spoke? Uh good. Uh, you know, I saw a new movie. You I enjoyed did. it thoroughly. Okay. Task Force X two. We'll get to that. We'll get to that soon. We will get to the Pete's reaction to the Suicide Squad. Of course, I gave mine last week, and I have since seen it again. So now I can kind of um, go a little did bit. Did you further grade it last time? I don't remember. Did I what? Did you give it a grade? I didn't grade it last time because if you remember, I saw it in the early screening. So we recorded very fast oh, after the that. Oh, the VIP. Yes. That's yeah, right. and I didn't want to say too much at the time. So, well, no, you can't. Yeah, now I can be a little bit more forthright uh, with my feelings on it, and and we're Don't going, guys. <laughs> we will talk. Uh, we will be giving talking about the film in its entirety, guys. So, if you haven't seen it yet, I can't believe if you listen to us that you haven't. But if you haven't, spoilers. Uh, we're going to be discussing spoilers there. So, and we're not talking you... about Stephanie Brown. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, since then as well, Pete. Um. Just we'll do, we'll do our little sports tangent now. The Yankees have been playing good baseball. Yeah, the, their so. their disabled list or injured list or whatever the hell list it's called is is about as good as any team in baseball, and <laughs> they're doing it with a mixed match of uh, has beens, up and comers, and uh, underachievers. So it's it's been pretty good. Uh, I'm excited. Uh, you know, two games out of the wild card, second spot, six games out of the division. And uh, the Mets seem to be going in the opposite direction. So everything seems to be going <laughs> back to normal, <laughs> back to normal. <laughs> yeah. But did you watch the, just real quick. Did you watch the game last night? I did. I I've never seen four blown saves in a row. Right. Wild <laughs> game, man. It's crazy going from seven innings of no runs, yes. no offense, completely lackluster baseball to four innings of insanity. <laughs> yeah. It was crazy. Like I, I, it was like they, we, the Yankees would score 
try to save, the Royals would score. And then just mm-hmm. kept going like that for a few innings. It was crazy. It was rough. Um, <laughs> it was rough to watch. Yeah, you're a Yankee emotion. fan. Yeah, it was rough for us to watch. But um, I'm happy for Velasquez. That guy's from the Bronx. And yeah, local for kid. The, yeah, so that's cool. That's a cool Living little story. Dream. Yep, cool little storyline to throw in there. Uh, <clears throat> so I really quickly also, um, sports related on the Olympics. Um, I don't remember if I spoke about this last week, and if I did, I'm sorry. But I love the Olympics, and I'm kind of going through post-Olympic depression because now I can't watch any of these things. <laughs> This year I wasn't into it actually. <laughs> so, uh, but I don't know why I all the controversy and all the political stuff that go with the Olympics when the games actually come on, all of that seems to go away and people just seem to mm-hmm. like it. So, yeah, baseball was back for the first time in a long time. I didn't watch any of that. I usually watch the swimming, um, and this year I just didn't really get into it. I don't know why. They lost um, the baseball team lost the gold medal game against Japan. They but did. It was, they, they lost to Japan, so maybe yeah. Cashman can go out and sign Tanaka and David Robertson and bolster the rotation. Um, but uh, yeah, like I, I do know, uh, Team USA won gold, I believe, in men and women basketball, which is great. Yes, and the women um, won the three new three on three tournament too. The women won okay, that. I didn't know that was a thing. Um, I yeah. do know that Team USA or Teams USA led the Olympics in gold medals or, or total medals. Yes. I don't think it was gold medals. I think it was total medals. So that's Both. great to hear. Both. Okay. Um, so, you know, uh, just a wonderful showing by uh, all the Olympic athletes. I mean, it was, you know, I, I didn't watch it, but I'm sure it was great. Um, you know, every people who have watched it have, uh, have said to have enjoyed it. And Yeah, I mean, I, I enjoyed it this year. Russia was banned, but they were still there. Can you explain that? The Russian, the country of Russia was banned, but their athletes were allowed to <laughs> to perform as the Russian Olympic Committee. What that means and how that's finagled to work, I have no idea. That was as corrupt as the NCAA. But yeah, it, the IOC definitely is. So not, we're not going to get on a huge tangent, but I just want to mention that because I enjoyed them so much and now they're over, I am literally at night, I'm like, I can't watch swimming anymore. I can't watch like all these things I enjoyed. The Dodgers oh. and the Padres are on. Watch them in all West baseball. That's uh, that's the best baseball you can watch. That's true. You're not wrong. Padres, Padres and Giants. Giants, yeah, that's true. I'm actually going to a Mets the Mets Dodgers game on Saturday at City Field, so I will be watching. Some you're going to get there early baseball. enough for um, Shake Shack, or are you going to end up going to get some Blue Smoke? There'll be no line there. <laughs> I don't Which know. It's just as good, in my opinion. Blue Smoke is done. I love Blue Smoke. Good. Yeah. We normally meet up at McFadden's first, mm-hmm. and then we go um, inside and whatever. So we'll see what happens. But I, it's my first baseball game since COVID. So uh, I'm a big fan of Ebbets Field. I like Ebbets Field. It's a nice little ballpark they got there. <laughs> Ebbets Field? Yeah. That's what it is. City. Yeah. Well, it's kind of patterned yeah. after it. Yeah. But yeah. There we go. That's true. <laughs> you can blame your uh, Dodgers obsessed owners at the that's time. That's true. Uh, yeah, the whole Jackie Robinson rotunda. Yeah, that's true. If they, want, if they wanted to be cool, they should have made the outside look like Ebbets Field, which they did, and make the inside uh, the polo grounds. That would have been cool if you really want to honor New York baseball instead of lie to everybody and just honor the Dodgers. But they're gone. Uh, Mr. Cohen's around, so no more stupidity from the Wilpon. So Mets fans rejoice. It looks like you actually have someone who's capable of running an organization. All right. So now that we've lost our entire audience, we could get into the stuff we normally, we normally talk about. Uh, and first, we will start, Pete. You mentioned you saw the Suicide Squad. Now, last mm-hmm. time, I obviously gave my quick reaction to it after seeing it in the, in the special screening, early screening. Mm-hmm. So I'll yeah. let you take the lead here. What are your impressions of the Suicide Squad? I really enjoyed it. Um, it was it's weird. Like when the, in terms of the whole, like de- great debate on, on Twitter of sequel or reboot, I think it's just kind of a redo, right? Cause you know, Waller explains everything. We go through the process. We learn about the bombs and all that. And that was fine. Um, I thought the cast, the chemistry of the cast wasn't as good as the chemistry of the cast in the first movie. I think the overall, overall movie here is a lot better. Certain things, dr- uh, there are certain things I didn't like that didn't, uh, affect my overall like of the movie like i thought mon gal was a little bit depowered i don't think mon gal would get killed by a helicopter i didn't like the characterization of calendar man 
But again, that was like really quickly, like two seconds in, you know, like, and they were gone. But again, the fact that Calendar Man made it into a movie is still impressive for me, even though this is a much different version of that character. I was also bummed out that Boomerang got killed. I love Boomerang. He's mm-hmm. one of my favorite Flash villains. But uh, I, I love Idris Alba as Bloodsport. King Shark uh, was – King Shark and Ratcatcher might be my favorite two of the film. Polka Dot Man was really well done. Uh, hit the, the emotional stories of Ratcatcher and Polka Dot Man really were the driving forces, I think. Margo was great as Harley. Um, I give the movie a, a, a high B+. Plus. It's not an A for me because I think there were certain things. I thought the Bloodsport – Peacemaker showdown at the at the camp was probably two kills too long. I thought the Harley date scene was too too long, and I I I almost think it could have been cut from the movie to be honest with you. Um, but th- those were the things that kind of dragged for me. But um, I really dug it. Uh, I thought there were a lot of really great shots by Gun. I thought Ratcatcher's backstory with her father on the on the bus, and how Gun shot that with the pain in the glass. I thought that was phenomenal. The fight between Flag and Peacemaker, uh, which we were watching through the helmet, mm-hmm. I thought that was an amazing shot. I thought that was brilliant. Um, Starro was absolutely, utterly amazing. Like I just, I can't believe they pulled it off perfectly. Like that is perfect Starro in my opinion. And uh, I love the deception and the misdirection of the movie. I thought that was great. Right. You know, one team basically was the sacrificial lamb for the other. Uh, you didn't. I, I didn't see the government being the main villain. I don't think Star Wars the villain at all. I think Star Wars as much of a victim as the Suicide Squad. Right. And when Star Wars basically just says like I was happy floating, staring at the stars, it hits you because you're like, this guy just you know, he just wants to go home and he can't and <laughs> he's pissed off and now right. he's getting eaten by a bunch of rats. <laughs> um, <laughs> just really great stuff. Um, you know uh, the. The, the, James Gunn is about as immature as I am, but there's like a certain, like sometimes for a movie though, it kind of just, it can be a little distracting, but the humor wasn't bad for me. It might've been a little bit more than I, what I wanted, you know, it wasn't like quite MCU humor, but it was definitely there. And, but that's just gun style, like in Slither and stuff. Um, so sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, like it worked really well in that movie. Um, and there were just a lot of like, it reminded me of a lot of cool movies from like that opening scene on the helicopter. Like it just, just it reminded me a lot of like predator right mm, just, yeah uh, and then like when they're going to the office building stuff like that, like it, it just like oh belco experiment and like there's stuff there's stuff that just of like other movies of the past and other james Gunn's things um you know and it was really cool and i i really dug it and i um i'm really looking forward to this peacemaker tv show so you know i, I think it's a great entry in the dceu and uh, i'm very happy we have it and uh, I'm just, it's interesting to have <laughs> new controversy to talk about now, isn't it? <laughs> well, were you, because I was, so I'll ask you this question. Were you surprised at how quickly they killed off some of the characters? No, not at all. I, not I think, at all? Well, not at all, because I think that's that's why when you announce a cast, and first of all, thank God he shot Pete Davidson in the face. <laughs> like, I think we all, I think we're all happy about that. Yeah, some of like, the deaths are really freaking brutal, right? Yeah. Like. Um, but when you have a cast, an ensemble cast that big in a movie like this, I mean, you, you thought, I mean, I knew half those guys are going to end up dead. Right. I did. It too. just wasn't who I thought it was going to be. Like I knew Harley was going to make it out. Obviously. But, um, I, I did think Boomer was going to make it out. I'm surprised Polka Dot Man went as far as he did. That was awesome though. Right. <laughs> that was such I, an awesome. I felt so bad. As soon as he got what he wanted, he got killed. <laughs> you know? And uh, it was just all the technology involving blood sport was fascinating. Um, awesome I, stuff. Yeah. Like watching him just pull stuff off his suit and create gun and just the way they looked. I mean, I thought that was really great. And that's, that's straight out of the minds of James Gunn at blood sport. Traditionally is more of a, let's say like, I don't know, guerrilla tactics, combat right. type guy. More of know? a soldier. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, I thought the reinterpretation, inter- reinterpretation of that character was great. I love the mask. I thought that was brilliant. Um, John Cena was absolutely amazing. Um, yeah, that's he's someone I specifically wanted to talk about because historically I do not like him as an actor. Uh, but this film, man, how many things has he been in? He's been in a lot more than you'd think. I only really know him in that. Amy, I know he did like one bad WWE movie, but I know he was in that. Yeah, he was in Trainwreck, which I thought he was, he was great in. He was in Bumblebee. 
That's right, he was. Um. So yeah, so like certain films of like he was pretty good in Trainwreck for the part they had him to play. He was pretty good, which I feel like is in line with this this role. Right, it's very similar to what this role was. I mean, that scene when he's standing there in his underwear is just incredibly funny. I love that entire scene. Mm-hmm. Um, but he really, obviously, they were setting this was the movie to set up what we're gonna get coming from him right and the peacemaker show I on thought HBO Max. The peacemaker show was a prequel i thought they said that this is how he becomes peacemaker what made him become this way uh but you know if if that was just you know dis- more deception on the hands of james gunn yeah uh, and i mean if obviously i mean like i said we're doing spoilers so in the film he does die or we think he dies but then the post credit scene shows that's not the case He's still alive. So that's what made me say, okay, well, maybe the Peacemaker show isn't a prequel. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a continuation of what's going on, what went on here. Uh, But yeah, I was pleasantly surprised by his performance. I definitely want to give that. Um, I agree with you on the, the, um, what's it called? The rescue scene, the flag rescue scheme where they're shooting, they're going kill for kill, Mm -hmm. him in Bloodsport. Some of those shots are hysterical. I mean, yeah, I didn't get all upset about the about the dick. <laughs> like I know people got really, yeah, I didn't know about it until they mentioned it on Twitter, and I had to go back and rewatch it. I was like, when they were talking about the the, the penis, I thought that people were upset because of Rat Catcher's pe- uh, not, um, weasel, not Rat Catcher, weasel okay. penis in the beginning of the movie. Because I remember during the trailer, that was a big deal. Like, oh man, the weasel's got a penis, and I'm like, okay, well, so does every dude. <laughs> Um, I was like, he's a giant rodent for crying out loud. Um, but I didn't even see the the second one in the camp. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I I do think that Harley's fight scene, her escape, is just as good as her GCPD escape in Birds of Prey. I, I really liked it. I thought that was great. Yeah, this I think each time we've seen Harley has been more like the Harley we know, mm-hmm. and I think this movie really became the the harley quinn that we know birds of prey was like suicide squad was eh. birds of prey was a little bit more and i think this one we got i personally enjoy birds of prey more than this movie that's just me but i i really i think that's not saying this isn't good that's like comparing like i don't know like i don't know it's like ferrari and lambo like they're both great sports cars like what you're really going to pretend like one's better than another um so in my opinion you know it's, it's just i like the characters in birds of prey more those are like harley huntress montoya those are more like my favorite characters so that's kind of why that movie gets the edge it's kind of like why i like rises so much because it involves no man's land and bane and catwoman like all that it's like oh, okay that's, it's more things i dig but i can't argue with you if you say the other one's better than the other um i just think, I think it's she, I, she was better with every outing right i just think it's been like a, a, a progression birds of prey was more of the zany st- the zany mm-hmm. harley this was kind of more of the brutal one she's definitely more um action-packed in this one she's got I mean, this, you talk about the scene, the date scene. Um, I was not expecting that, but that was totally, I wasn't either. That oh, was totally something Harley. Harley would do, right? Like, oh, it's very Harley. I just, yeah. to me, I thought you could have done without it. It kind of, for me, it kind of was real. It was the slowest part of the movie. I kind of lost slight interest in it. I was just kind of like, okay, like, what does this have to do with anything? Because if you ask me, you could have went from her being at the beach to her being, you know, tase shocked, right? right. I don't think you needed the whole thing, but like, whatever, like it, it's Margot Robbie, it's Harley Quinn. Um, you know, how are you going to say no to her if you're the studio? Right. Like, right. I mean, you want, right. She's arguably uh, the biggest star in that movie. Yes. I, I mean, I can argue that Cena is because of his WWE connection. You can obviously go that route and say, That's wow, John call. Cena has, you, you know, could. when you're thinking of people who might go see the film, if they say, Oh, John Cena's in it. And good and bad, because there's a lot of WWE fans who hate him as well. So you mm-hmm. have like the hate watchers and, and the people who love him. So I can make that argument. But I think as far as films go, you're right. She's the biggest star in the movie. Not named Sylvester Stallone, who we don't see. He's just the voice. So obviously he no, would be the biggest Stallone star. Stallone was great. I mean, He like, was. He was. I remember, oh man, a while ago, we, we were talking to Casey Walsh about this when we had Casey on, and I was, I, I remember he, he kind of talked me into Stallone being Starro, and I was like, really? I felt he was more King Shark, yeah. and I was glad that it worked out so well, because it's just, it's cool, it's just hand, it's just like, it's kind of quotable, bird, you know, like, yep. even though it's one word, it's that, it's Stallone's voice is so, like, it's just so captivating to me, you know, it's the, it's just so deep. You know, it's like, it's like Barry White, like, you know, 
<laughs> yeah. Or Isaac Hayes. Like it's, <laughs> it's that type of voice where you just hear it and you kind of stop in your tracks. But I just, and I loved King Shark. And this was a new interpretation of King Shark. He was kind of dumbed down. He was more yep. comic relief. He wasn't, he got angry and he turned into King Shark really quickly. We saw yeah. that a few times. But I, I was into this, you know, like me smart book read, you know. <laughs> I was like, caveman talk is funny to me. But, the mustache, um, I would wear disguise. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so I dug it. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really happy with it. I, I, I am. I think this is a really good one, and I like that this is. There are even more obscure characters than the first. Yeah. Um, I, I do wish that we weren't in a pandemic because I think uh, that would be, uh, you know, obviously beneficial if you know we were living in a normal time. Right. But, you know, from everything that I've heard, you know, outside of a specific group of fans, this movie is great. Yeah. I mean, critically it was reviewed. Well, if you believe rotten tomatoes, it's net 90%, which I mean, obviously that's great. So if, if critic, the critics loved it, as you said, it might, it would have been nicer to see exactly what it could have done outside of a pandemic. I think that's the larger reason why um, the box office was underwhelming. I'm not going to say it was bad because it, it's the largest our opening movie um, in in this time. Like in this, Best in and this Furious time. wasn't rated R. No, interesting. I, I didn't know that. So, so this was the largest R opening uh, that we've had in the pandemic, and obviously the HBO Max numbers definitely impact show that this movie was watched more than we thought it was the it even beat wonder woman 84 uh, more people watched the suicide squad than wonder woman 84 which shocked me because we were in worse times then um were we i, I don't know delta seems pretty bad no but things were still shut down and and well, capacity limits right, were still December. very small so i was surprised to see that and also because Wonder Woman is so far Wonder Woman. <laughs> right. Like, right. Like you would assume and all the, <clears throat> her, obviously gal was in it. You had Kristen Wiig from Saturday Night Live, Mr. Um, Pedro Pascal, obviously from the Mandalorian. Like you had these big names in this film. Yeah. And um, so when I saw the Suicide Squad did better, I was like, okay, that's kind of cool to know that as well. So I think like obviously we're in a time now where we're going to have to look at box office differently, especially if you have live streaming options attached to it. I think there's no way um, around it. I think Shang Chi is the first movie we're going to get or comic book movie we're going to get that doesn't have, not going to have a streaming release with it. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll know you, then. What is the release date on that? Do you know September third? I believe okay, so. It's so coming that's right soon. around the corner. Yeah, yeah. So I think we'll see. We'll also see then if Marvel still has its touch, right? Normally, if it's Marvel, people will go see it, just give the benefit of the doubt because they've built that up. So we'll see this, a lesser known well, character. Black Widow pulled on a lot of money. It did, but everyone and knows her, and, right? Yeah. Like They knew her. This is a character nobody knows a lot about unless you're an avid Marvel, Marvel reader. I know nothing about this character. Right. So honest. we're really going to see this time, um, you know, What's the box? What true box office is going to be for a comic book movie in this time? I mm -hmm. think that's going to really show the show the um, <clears throat> show the truth. So I'm with you, Pete. I I liked it a little more. So I didn't grade it last time. I'm going to give it more. I gave it an A. Uh, it's mm -hmm. it hit everything I wanted it to hit in the film. I was worried about Star, which surprisingly a lot of the people that are more at least my friends who are mainstream, you consider mainstream audience people. They thought Star retracted from the film. They thought it was silly. They thought it was. They thought Did he was they? too. Yeah. So, <clears throat> for me though, I loved it. I thought it was great. Yeah. All the characters, as you said, were were each character was given plenty of time to shine. No one was shorted. Uh, the story was fine. It was it was um, a strong story. It was believable. It was nice that they threw he threw Corto Maltese back in there, right? That like that was cool for us. That's fans a great of, little nod. Uh, yep. you know, may, I know it comes from Dark Knight Returns, but like when I hear that, I think of eighty nine, right? So like we have all we have some connections there. I think it was just really well done. And James Gunn, I just want to say thank you. Yeah, uh, I liked the first Suicide Squad, even though I know all. I totally understand why people don't. Same here. And but I enjoyed it, except for the the final third. But this is so much better, such a more, more uh, well-made film. So yeah, so James Gunn, thank you very much. And uh, would you I'm, go 
would you go down your DCEU rankings? Let's do that real quick. Oh, Let's I can't do that. I don't. I have to pull up my letterbox. <laughs> oh, well, okay, fine. Then I'll, I'll go first. And while you're. Yeah, you go first. So, this is what I'll do. This is uh, just my uh, my ranking of how, how much I enjoyed these movies. Um, and if you listen to the Batman on Film Social Hour, you've heard this before as I, as I discuss this with the gunslinger. Uh, top dog, I still have Wonder Woman at number one. Number two, I have Shazam. Three, I have Aquaman. Four, I have uh, one of your favorite movies, BVS, followed by Man of Steel, Birds of Prey, The Suicide Squad, uh, The Greatest Film Ever Made, Zack Snyder's Justice League, Wonder Woman 1984, uh, Warner Brothers, David Ayer's Suicide Squad at 10, and uh, Josh Whedon's Justice League at number 11. So that's my DCEU. All right, so my updated list, it goes like this. Wonder Woman, has, like you, Wonder Woman is number one. The Suicide mm-hmm. Squad is number two. Mm-hmm. Aquaman is third. Man of Steel, I have fourth. Shazam is fifth. Birds of Prey, sixth. Wonder Woman, 84, seventh. The Theatrical Justice League, eight. Zack Snyder's Justice League, nine. Suicide Squad, 10. And BVS, 11. We actually have a lot of movies in similar spots. Yes, we do. Like our one, pro- three, six. <laughs> <laughs> Which is probably why this show works. <laughs> but um, but I know again, people... Like, I'm bigger on BBS than most. Well, I always get... That's the, always the one people see. They're like, you have it last? I said, it's all based on my, my expectations going into the film. They were so I, high. So high. I put, I put my... Uh, my my uh, letterbox picture up on Twitter, <laughs> and uh, I got like, how can you have BVS and Zack Snyder's Justice League so low? And it's kind of funny because it's like, aren't you like the group of people who are like, can't we just like what we like? Why do you guys have to bother us? So it's like, I, was I like, saw that. I, just, I let I let it go. <laughs> it's yeah. like you can't make everybody happy. So if you guys want to argue with us about our lists, you can uh, definitely can. I'd um, love to talk about it. Yeah, you guys want to come at us or ask us questions or or share your list with us, you can tweet us your lists or, you know, send it on the Facebook page. If you guys are on our Facebook group, send it there. I'd love to discuss them, uh, you know, these movies in depth. I do think. Um, but let me say, I, I do, don't hate any of them. I don't. Right, I don't. One of them. There's not. Yeah, one, I don't. And that includes both versions of Justice League. I, I, I like them. I, I do. Like, I don't hate. I don't hate these movies at all. There's not one movie I despise. I agree. There's no, none of these movies would make a hate list for me. Uh, there are things in them that I absolutely love in all of them. Every mm-hmm. single film, there are things that I love immensely. So yeah, it's just, again, just my list. And I'll say like four through four through nine are almost interchangeable to be brutally honest. Like they're, they're, yeah, there they're are just, things you know, they're, you know, they're a hair apart. They really are. Right. If if anyone p- sees my list or posts my list, I even put in there they're always subject to change or they can be in flux. Depending oh, it's the on changing list. It's like it's it changes right? every time I look at it. Depending on the time of day, the mood I'm in, you know, the like amount of times I flip flop BVS and Man of Steel is countless. To be brutally honest, and I'm the same way with Man of Steel in my Superman rankings. Like Man of Steel and Superman Returns constantly get flip flop for me. Okay, so. It yeah, works. I I agree with you. Outside of Wonder Woman being a strong one for me, and probably the, now the Suicide Squad being a strong two, I think the rest of them, depending on my mood, could switch around. And I don't, my on top the, two are my top two. Like I I tell you, I am an, I'm a huge defender of Shazam. I love that. I love movie. Shazam. It's got so much heart. It's 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 an amazing tale. It's so grounded, but it's so fantastical. It's Shazam checks off every box on my list. It really is. Uh, it, it's it's. You know, it's 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 close to Wonder Woman. One and two are very close. You know, um, if I had to, I don't want to go tears because I know Haas hates tears, but that's in a that's in a tear all on its own. You know, if I had to do a Garrett <laughs> Grimm. Exactly, I agree with you there. I think that still is the standard of this universe. Wonder Woman is still the best yeah. movie, and I got no problem with the third act. I know people got problems with the third act. I yeah, I don't either. They're gods. Hey, I mean, it's just, <laughs> hey look. All I know is Rick, Rick, she knows more about this stuff than I do. <laughs> oh boy. I love, you, Ricky. I love you, Ricky. So guys, you've heard Pete and I now discuss the suicide squad. We've given our uh, reviews of it. If you guys want to talk to us about 
the Suicide Squad, what your reactions are, what you thought. Obviously, as you know, hit us up on Twitter, on our own handle, each mm -hmm. of our handles. You can do the show handle or in fa on Facebook if you're in our groups. Hit us up there. We'll if you talk loved about it, if that. you hated it, we just want to, we're, we're curious. We just want to gauge the audience. Yeah, I want to, just to kind of know, because you brought, a lot of people have been mentioning that they at DC has a film, pro, uh, a film problem a or a movie problem. problem. Right. Brand. It's the brand. Right, a brand problem. I don't su completely subscribe to that. Uh, I think the solo films obviously have been received very well for the most part. Um, I think certain elements are the issue for me. I I, I think it has had a brand problem. I think I think Wonder Woman would have made a lot more money if it wasn't you know kind of the third film out, right? Um, I think Wonder Woman would have made a billion. I want to say more money, but it made it made a ton of money. Um, but I think the further you get from the old regime and the farther you go, that I guess for lack of a better term, that stench will fade. And I, I just and again, that's be patient. Let uh, Mister Hamada and company do what they got to do. Let's see what happens. We. From 2013 to, to 2017, like that was one regime. We got a new regime and they're doing things. And, you know, it, it happens all the time. The, the Nolan era was one, was one thing. The, the, the Snyder era was another thing. And this, this era is a brand new start, you know, and, and that's what happens, you know, and, and that's the way Warner Brothers works. They, they don't do the Marvel stuff. And, you know, and I think all fans are openly honest when they say don't copy Marvel. I think we're, right. we're, we're all open. We, we don't want to have two of the same thing. We want superhero movies, but you know, we, we wouldn't mind something a little different. And uh, they tried doing it one way. It didn't work and it seems a little rushed, but now it seems they've kind of gathered their footing and we'll see what happens. And you know, the next one out is the Batman. And that is that I think that's the movie we got to look at. If, if DC WB has a brand problem and it affects the Batman, then then there's problems. Like let's let's just be honest. There's if well, it affects the Batman and the audience doesn't show up for that because, you know, remember at one point people thought Begins was a prequel to eighty nine. Yep. It, it, it be, if, there's, if there is a brand problem, then you will know that there is a brand problem for the Batman because you could still use the excuse if you want to. If it, if you want to consider an excuse, you could still use I guess the phrase of uh, coronavirus that this is what or Delta variant that this is preventing people from going out. Even though, like me and Eric have argued about this, I, I, I mean, Yankee Stadium, uh, hey, Kauffman Stadium last night, forty three thousand people, no problems. I know it's an outdoor ball, an outdoor ballpark, but the Tampa Bay Lightning had full had sell out, sell out crowds in the in the Stanley Cup. Yeah, final. but that's Florida. You, you gotta you have to. Yeah, have to I know. That but, caveat. but like, are, I mean, people people aren't going to the movies in Florida. Apparently, like Suicide Squad <laughs> is, is is you know, according to the articles, a a, a you know a, a, is a, a flop, right? I don't think it is. I think it's fantastic. Um, but then they're like, I don't know how to judge anything. I'm not a box office expert. I right. don't read the articles. I think it depends who you listen to. Like it's, uh, I said underwhelming. Oh, that's, the that's the phrase of the right? day. Like dude. I think it depends. Yeah. Like it depends who you listen to regarding the suicide squad. Underwhelming to me is a better term because they expected around 30 million. This did like domestically, this did 26, mm -hmm. five. So I guess you can kind of be like, yeah, Whatever it did, it's five million short. So I guess you can say, but I don't know. I think it when you think of when you put everything in, mm -hmm. um, in the bag, it kind of makes sense. Like it kind of makes sense. I'm with you. I'm just, I'm, I'm just <laughs> like when we're talking about this, I'm not like I'm not telling somebody that I'm like I'm more or less like throwing out theories and seeing what you all think because it's like I, how many I, I ask questions I just do and it's like that's like my thing and then I kind of I, I gauge other people's responses and I try to figure out what's what just based on like what other people's opinions are but like you know like I don't know how you can compare this to even like Fast and Furious or like you said Wonder Woman or anything like I think the movie you compare this to is Jungle Cruise and if The Rock is going on social media every day thanking you for the success of jungle cruise i think that's the movie you've got to compare it to to be honest right and I, it I, had a larger worldwide opening larger worldwide Squad. opening yeah and, and, but uh you know jungle cruise has also had i think a, two, a week head start yes so at the second week for suicide squad we can gauge you better and i, I think right. that's the movie you want to compare it to and because right. i don't understand it i mean i, I talked to bill about this not too long because I, I just don't understand like, how is jungle cruise success if it opens less 
than Suicide Squad, and that's considered a failure. Like, that doesn't make sense to me. It almost feels like people are picking and choosing what to talk about. And as a fan, I, I kind of get confused. Like, I'm just like, what? Do you, like, what's so? What's a failure and what's a success? If you guys are saying it both ways, right? I I mean, most people look at budget, right? They say, okay, mm-hmm. this was made on this budget. This was made on this budget, budget. And that's, and, yeah. right? And that's how they gauge success. So, I I know both of us will tell people to go see it, right? Like, hundred percent. Go go to the movies, go see it. But I do think I plan on seeing it a second time this weekend. Yeah, this would, it would be my third if I see it again in the theaters. So. I've watched it twice on HBO Max. You know, just but I do, yeah. and not because I didn't want to go see it in the theater. It's it honestly, it's just because like it was late. You know, I watched it after a ball game. <laughs> that that's really what it was. It was like, oh, yeah. let me watch the Suicide Squad. The Yankees are over. Like right. everything during baseball season, everything gets or everything is orchestrated around whatever the time the Yankee game is. Right. So in Kansas City, it starts an hour later at eight o'clock. So things are, but yeah, but that, but that's it. You know, and uh, I plan on supporting it, and I really do love the movie. And thank you, James Gunn, for your just insane mind, insane mind, because I'm, I love it. Like my favorite movie of Gunn is still Slither. So I think that's a phenomenal movie. Um, Roker, Elizabeth Banks, and uh, Nathan Fillion are in it. It's phenomenal. But uh, like, oh, I'm glad you said his name because he's only made one movie I don't like, and it's Guardians Two. How awesome was TDK? Like. (laughs) I love the interaction on the hel- the helicopter was one of my favorite interactions. Like, oh, no, when he's like, "What is your name?" He's like, "That that is my name." He's like, "He's embarrassed of his name." It's um, me. So that was great. <laughs> yeah, it's me. Your name is letters. <laughs> All names are letters, dickhead. <laughs> like, yep. it was just, but it was I great. mean, when they say send him out and his arms just pop off and then he's just That's like slapping nothing. the helmets. It is nothing. It's amazing. It's amazing, and it's like. Man, Waller really put this team together to die. <laughs> and a lot of people complained about Waller thinking she and I, I do think she was probably a little bit more ruthless in, in the in the air or what in 2016's version, because she killed all those people who she was yes. with, correct? Right, she, exactly. And you're waiting for her to just shoot the fat guy. <laughs> <laughs> and it yeah. never happens. And in fact, it's the opposite. So they kind of depowered her a little bit, you know. And uh, but I thought that's what would made the the end of the movie so great is that, you know, I I to be honest, I don't think I've ever really seen anyone stand up to Waller like that in 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 any form of media, You're comics, right. animation, or movies. Like Waller is a terrifying individual, and uh, you know, I, I do think it worked. You know, but again, like she was. No. Yeah, that was oh. the best. For, she was the best part of the first movie for me, and I don't think we got a lot of her. Really good. I don't think we got a lot of her in this one, uh, but you're right. Just enough. The ruthlessness that she has—that's just evident, completely evident. So, uh, yeah, as you can see, guys, we could talk about this movie for hours because we've gone over. I think what, forty minutes. <laughs> yeah, we've got over a little bit what we I think we planned on, but. We got we got a second show to go to. Yes. So we're going to start now with our our geekly news I like to call it. So every week we get topics that hot topics that are in the industry and in, in the excuse me in the entertainment industry and we like to bring them to you as you know. So I'm going to start with the news that we have a casting for Blue Beetle. Wonderful. Yes. So the casting is Zolo Maraduena. I think that if I say your name wrong, I'm sorry, but I think that's how it's. I'm called. so glad I don't have to pronounce some of these names. <laughs> Can and, we just call him XM? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and if you are a fan of the co- now the Netflix, it started on um, yeah, YouTube TV. Now it's on Netflix. The Cobra Kai show. Uh, he is the lead, one of the leads of that show. And uh, so now he will be playing Blue Beetle. You watch that show, right? Yes, I do. Okay. He will be on Blue. He will now be playing Blue Beetle. What with the show that will be on HBO Max. It's a movie. I thought it was a movie. Yeah, it's sorry, a movie, movie. My fault. Okay, okay. you're right. So he's playing the Jaime Reyes character. Obviously, the, that's the third character who was Blue Beetle. So, uh, Pete, you watch Cobra Kai, right? No, I don't. That's an 80s show. That's an 80s thing I don't get. <laughs> there's a lot of 80s things I don't, I, I missed out. Like, it, there's a whole, like, section of, like, Garrett and Eric Media that totally missed me. Well, did you watch The Karate Kid? Do Have you seen that? I have. It's just, it's just, okay. I have seen Karate Kid. It's okay. just not, like, in my, like, when I was growing up, it wasn't one of those things where I was like, oh, I love this movie. It was cool. Right. You know, wax on, wax off. I remember that because of Ninja <laughs> Turtles, not because of Karate Kid. That's but, funny. Uh, 
yeah, but um, everyone raves about Cobra Kai. Everyone tells me to watch Cobra Kai. Everyone's really into it. So again, it's like great. The fan base is behind this. I know. I know. Nico Caruso is about as hyped as Zeddy is for this casting. Like these guys, you know, they they watch everything under the sun, so they're like kind of like my barometer. I know. But, uh, I'm pumped. Everyone seems really into it. Um, he was at the Suicide Squad premiere. He's really enthusiastic on Twitter. He's so like ready for this role, and this is the role of a lifetime, right? Like this is you know big time superhero movie. Everyone wants it. And Blue Beetle is so cool. Like I love Jaime Reyes. Um, he's great in Injustice. That's probably my favorite right. version of Jaime. Yeah. Um, yeah. Blue Beetle is a is a character. Like I grew up with Jaime more than I did Ted Cord. So I'm really excited that it is Jaime. And I just I can't wait to see what this movie's about. It's it's the whole scarab thing and being kind of like an alien. I it fascinates me. I'm I'm just. It's one of those movies like I can't wait for like the first shot of the suit or the first trailer because I'm like that's going to just set everything up because I don't know what to expect, and that's fun for me. Like, you know, characters that I don't really know it, that are not Batman and Nightwing and Robin and Superman, but like Blue Beetle is getting a movie. That's awesome. Me, I can't wait to see the greater you know, and that's why I like the DCEU title because it is extended. Like they're extending the universe into right. various forms. Like that's why I don't think it's a bad title. Um, but I'm all for it. Like I just, again, this guy is, this kid is so hyped up for his role. I'm really happy for him. The, him and the director were both at the squad premiere. So like, you know, they seem to be really uh, well embraced by the DC family. And like, I'm just, I'm ready to get going. I can't wait until they start production on this thing. I agree with you. And it's another example or another sign that things are going well in this universe, because as we know in the past, there's been many times they've announced stuff and it hasn't come to pass. This got announced, mm -hmm. the director got named, and now we have the casting of the main character. Makes you feel really good that, yeah, this is probably going to happen. So, um, if Which you is don't... Like, when you mention stuff that gets announced and happens, kind of like, like, like the J.J. Abrams Superman movie with Coates. Right. Like, we haven't heard anything about that since. You're right. And then they're talking about this other Michael B. Jordan Superman movie. Right. And I'm just like, okay, so this that, that to me almost feels like w, old WB where they're like, this is an idea. Like, and I think they gauge fan encouragement and engagement off the news. And they're like, okay, they're more hyped about this than this. So I think we should right. make this a priority, but I don't know. I'm not an insider, but that's just how I feel. You're right. And casting him off a show that's really hot that people love the, if, um, in Cobra Kai. So oh. now you're not, and you're also going to, the show kind of caters to both the fans of Karate Kid and to a new generation now. Because it's it's focused a lot on the younger kids as well, so I think you're going to be bringing in both audiences be, by this casting because they know him, and I think that's a, a really really smart idea, especially for a, a character like Blue Beetle, like as you said, not many people know about. So looking forward to this. This movie is slated to come out. I don't see. I always do this all the time. I think it was slated for 2023. So we'll see. We'll see what's going to happen with that going forward. But yes, excellent casting and can't wait to see the movie. Can't wait to see the film. No, I'm with you hundred percent. I'm really pumped. I'm Googling it right now. Sorry for Sorry. the dog barking. It's fine. No problem. All right. So moving right along, we know we're getting uh, the most very hotly anticipated show on Disney plus called what if, which we discussed last week because we got a trailer and there were things, um, it looked fantastic. Like there's, I know there's a lot of, um, a lot of really cool angles they're going with it. But one thing su was surprising that I read this week and that you said, like, as we know, a lot of the, the stars of the live action shows voiced their characters on what if, but one did not. And it was a pr little surprising. So Dave Batista's Drax was not voiced by Batista. And he said he was never asked. Um, cause pet fans were going for asking him and he said he was never asked, which was a little surprising because we do have a lot of the characters from the live action voicing their characters. And he seemed a little annoyed about it. Um, obviously we didn't see an actual, um, we didn't see an actual response from him. It was something on Twitter that he sent. So we can't really gauge his reaction with that, but he seemed the way he answered it made me think he's a little bit annoyed that he wasn't asked. So were you surprised, Pete, to find out that? I'm surprised he wasn't asked. I'm not surprised he's not annoyed. Uh, James Gunn was surprised he wasn't asked too. So right. I don't know why he's 
when we saw this earlier, we were like, oh, this sounds like this character. This doesn't. So, right. I don't know. It would make sense, wouldn't you want, unless unless these guys are priced out of the range. Yep, that's possible too. You don't know what their budget was, and I mean, not to um, diminish his star power because, as we know, it's been getting bigger and bigger. You're not if you're going to cut corners, he might be one of the characters you cut corners on, right? So yeah, I mean, he's kind of comic relief, I right? Don't know. So but I like, love the character, but and hit the way he plays it. But if you're going to cut. Would, Cut corners, you might get bitter, and he, you know, he kind of was like, "Well, I should have been paid for this role." So, Guardians Three, you got to bump it up a little bit, you know. Maybe he makes it up that end. Yep. So, keeping with what if, and this is kind of a cross too as well. So, staying in the what if um, section, Jeffrey Wright, who was voicing the Watcher on What If, had an article in the Hollywood Reporter where he talked about this, not only this, but also he talked about obviously everything we're waiting for the Batman. So they asked Jeffrey Wright about playing the watcher and his response was, he doesn't really know much about the character, but I tried to find out as much as I could um, who he is, what he is, what he does and what he's capable of in this case. And his voice he ch- from that is where he got his voice and applied it to um, the character. His voice is good, regardless. So. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so what? Uh, I this is one of the Marvel characters that I also don't know that much about. So, uh, well, I mean, like the Watcher to me is Marvel's answer to the the Monitor. You know, he's kind of like that. He watches everything from it. Right. The Watcher. Um, he's a cool character. He's mysterious. He pops up every now and then. Um, we saw him. When did they? They had a cameo. Gun directed. It was a. It was one of Stanley's last cameos in The Watcher. I forget what movie was at the end of, but I remember Gun actually directed that scene. Um, so they have popped up in the MCU, and this is just gonna. This is really cool. I just. <laughs> I'm. I love what if stories. I mentioned this before. Like, what if Spider Man kept the six arms? You know, what right. Spider Man married Black Hat stuff like that. What if the What if the Venom symbiote attached itself to the Punisher? Like these things are cool, and you know. You, the fan base isn't going to get mad at them because you're making drastic changes to characters because it's kind of like a one and done. Right. So it's it's a genius thing. And just to have Jeffrey Wright attached to this project speaks volumes because I don't think the guy takes crappy roles. Yeah, I haven't seen him in anything where I've been like, he's been bad or mm. like the role was bad. He's actually pretty, pretty I fell solid. I in love with him in Shaft. He played Peoples Hernandez. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we had Batman, he, the Watcher, who was Jim Gordon, and uh, Sam and Nick Fury. <laughs> yeah, <the> same movie. <laughs> that's true. Wow, I just realized that. Good point. So he continues on in the article. Obviously, guys, this is on the Hollywood Reporter. So just so you know where I'm getting this from, um, he continues on the article to talk about the Batman, obviously, um, which I think the, the majority of people listening to us are most interested in. So, yeah. So his quote was, it was gothic. It was sleuthful, if that's a word. It was mysterious and it was tricky. It was tricky because of the conditions that we were working in. It was isolation for those of us who were away from home, out of the country, over in London. I experienced more quarantines than I would wish on anyone going back and forth over the last six months. So it was a pretty dogged one to tr- dogged one to try and pull off. But what I will say about it is, too is that it was really gratifying because we all unified around the purpose of doing our jobs, making this film, protecting one another, and getting through it together. And we did. I think we made a brilliant movie, and we did it as a collective that came together as one. So kind of, um, what's it called? Kind of, not much to say about the actual film itself, but you could tell the amount of work that was put into it and how dedicated everyone was by that quote. Yeah, so, I just ima- I can't imagine making a film like the Batman, or just, I mean, th- then there were numerous productions that got shut down. I can't imagine making just a film in this type of environment, right? Like I, I give so much credit to all those involved in entertainment, whether it's it's sports broadcasting, uh, movie production, television production. Like again, you know, the, the people behind the scenes are are the ones who are masked up and face shielded while you know everyone right. in front of the camera is it pretends like it's just another day at the office mm-hmm. so like everyone just really getting together to 
for the greater good of the movie and just, you know, obviously everyone's getting paid for it, but you know, I'm sure some people were worried if they were going to not have jobs and whatnot. So it was a crazy time. And just to see everyone come together and how confident he is in this film, it just, it, it makes me confident. It, 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 you know, going forward to just the amount. And, and again, like Warner brothers is confident. They got the, we got the prequel show, um, you know, attached to this. I don't think they, they make that if they think this thing's a bomb. Right. And that, I felt the same way about Peacemaker and Suicide Squad. Like just they're confident right. in what they have. So I, I'm really pumped. I, I love what he has to say. I love how confident he is. But then again, let's, let's, let's remember like, you know, just, we got to see it first because Affleck was extremely confident about BVS. Mm-hmm. You're right. So just, let's just, I, I don't want this thing to bomb. And I, I said earlier, like if there is a, a, if there is a brand problem with DC, it, it will affect the Batman. And that's when things are going to really need to start to change. But, you know, I just, I, I'm going to be positive. I'm going to be optimistic. I can't wait for this. Everyone knows I love Batman. And uh, I, I just, I'm pumped. Like, just, I'm ready for some solo Batman. I'm ready for a Gotham City adventure. I'm just, I'm really excited. Well, you did mention one thing. The uh, the show on H, um, that will be on HBO Max, the prequel show. Mm. And today, just today, just today, we got word of what the title for that show would be. Or the working title for that show is mm-hmm. currently. And it's Arkham. So that kind of gives you a little insight as to what this show is going to be about. I know we heard it was GCPD related and the title being Arkham makes me think it's going to be in that kind of a shell somewhere around the Arkham, um, the Arkham Asylum. Mm -hmm. Um, So Pete, what we wouldn't, that wasn't originally on the rundown, but since that happened today, what do you think of the work? That was for next show's rundown. Thank you, Eric. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But no, it's great news because it kind of gives you an idea of what it's going to be leaning towards. So, you know, it, it may be, you know, the beginning, uh, uh, you know, you, you'll Arkham Asylum will be involved. It's not going to be a, an NYPD blue type thing, right? Right. It's definitely, this is definitely a DC Comics Batman type story. Okay. You know, it, it may not have the Joker or it may not have Two-Face, but I would imagine you're going to see the Falcons. You're going to see the Maronis. You may see some sort of like power struggle there. Um, it, it, you know. It would, I would, obviously, uh, it's going to involve police. Uh, so I'm just, I'm interested to see what happens. Um, the title's interesting. I would, it'd be cool to have some setting in, in Arkham Asylum. Arkham, I feel like the most we saw Arkham was Batman Begins. We had a little bit in Batman Forever, a little bit in Batman and Robin. It was, it was heavily in, uh, in Batman Begins. So I'm just, I'm just happy that this thing is just moving forward. And, uh, you know, we have a title and it's cool because it, it gives you just a little bit of an element of what the show is. Because it's like I said earlier, it's not going to be a straight up cop show. There's going to be some sort of, you know, psychological involvement here. Right. And I think that's interesting. The title also, well, Arkham is a character in itself, right? Like, uh, I, b- I believe uh, there's many Arkhams and depending on, you know, what Batman story you're reading, uh, Martha Wayne is either a descendant, a descendant of the Arkham's or the right, Kane's. Yeah. Yes. So it, go, it depends on what's going on, but you know, and that could play a factor in it too. Um, yep. So it, it's again, just the more we find out about it, the more interesting it is. And I, I, you know, I'm interested to see what Matt Reeves comes up with. Me too. I I'm wondering how far back they're going to go with, with Arkham. Mm-hmm. The fact that uh, Gordon's in it though, obviously lends you to believe it's not going to be too far. But uh, it's going to be interesting to see. And I, <laughs> I, I jokingly posted on our Facebook page that I guess the date, the title Gotham had been used already. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist when I saw that. I'm like, oh, I guess they couldn't use Gotham again. So, but um, no, I'm how about, looking how about like the real Gotham? <laughs> I'm looking forward to this. If you can call show. Suicide Squad too, the Suicide Squad. How about like the Gotham? The real right. Gotham? The Gotham, the Gotham. <laughs> but no, I, I, I like you. I'm very much looking forward to this, uh, this show, and uh, I can't wait to see, like you said, what Matt Reeves has in store for this, and yeah. of course the Batman. So I maybe this is why that. Terrence Winter left. Like maybe this psychological element is just too much for him. Which it's strange that you'd say that because a lot of his writing deals with that, but it's possible. It's very, very possible. So we'll see how that goes. But sti- um, sticking with Jeffrey Wright and Batman, um, we got the rest of the list for the audio adventures that's going to be released. I 
on HBO Max. Um, so we know Jeffrey Wright originally was we know was going to star as Batman, but now it's been learned that Rosario Dawson will star as Catwoman and John Leguizamo will portray the Riddler. That's fascinating to me. Right? It is. Pretty Luigi cool. Luigi is the Riddler? Come on. Just trading up greens. I know. <laughs> also, Jason Sudeikis, Seth Meyers, Bobby Moynihan, Keenan Thompson, Heidi Gardner, and Fred Armisen um, will be in this show. And so, it's coming. It's also coming to the HBO uh, Max app. So you can yes. listen to it there. Which I think right. is cool because I think before it was on something else and you might have to because this is the Goyer thing, is it not? I believe. Well, this I is heard, originally heard it was Goyer. Spotify. Um, yeah, and I think Goyer was involved, and in, you know, if you didn't have Spotify, you couldn't listen. But now that it's on, it's on HBO Max, apparently. Right. So I think that's really interesting. Um, I didn't know you could listen to podcasts on the app. I didn't either, and apparently this is their first foray into streaming podcasts. Mm-hmm. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, it, to but, be to be brutally honest, this almost feels like an old AT and T thing to build up HBO Max, but we all know like <laughs> AT and T's cutting and running right now, so right. It, it's it's funny. Um, I'm I'm excited for this again. Like we talked about Jeffrey Wright's voice, I'm really interested to see what this man does with the Batman voice. Yeah, I agree. I mean, like he can be deep. <laughs> You're right. Really no, I this. agree with you on this. That's um, you know, what's it called? Yeah, that's pretty. Hey, the fact that he's involved in all of this right now in this universe is crazy. And he, that he's playing Gordon in one and Batman voicing Batman in the other, it's just really a really awesome get for them. I would especially, oh, especially oh. off the success of Westworld. Yes. Um. So yeah, like he his presence right now is is a positive thing. Hopefully, the Batman does as good as I want it to do to gather a sequel. And then I would love to I would love to hear Wright and Pattinson talk about their versions of Batman, considering they're in the movie together. You know what I'm saying? Like, that would be interesting to me. Like I feel like not many times do you get to ask an actor who play two actors who play the same character who are in the same project, right? Like, I mean, like I'm trying to think. Like, have Clooney and Affleck ever been in the same movie? Because I would love to. You know, stuff like that would be fascinating to me, just to talk to them about their differences playing Batman, what they experienced. And like, you know, when, when, ba- when Affleck got the role, Bale told him, make sure they put a fly in the suit. So you go to the bathroom. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like it's even like, it's little things like that. And just going right. back and you're hearing Val talk about, it, he's like, I couldn't go to the bathroom alone. So to hear guys talk about Batman, even though like Wright's not playing uh, a Batman in a suit, but just like the motivations, like, how, like, okay. Like how would you have done, how would your Batman have done this? You know, just cool little like fun fanboy things. Yeah, that would be cool. Uh, that would be fun stuff to to hear and see. That would be cool, cool stuff. All right, sticking in, so let's stick in DC. We're gonna go back a little bit. We talked the Suicide Squad. There was an article after the Suicide Squad came out about James Gunn's future involvement. It's actually an art article about the movie and how it came together and all the people who were involved and how no one could have done it but James Gunn. All of that. But there's a, a snippet in the article on THR that also talks about the future of James Gunn in the DC universe. So they asked Walter Hamada, who, as we know, is the head of DC Films. And he said, Gunn is always welcome back, whatever he wants to do. He really has a vision and he's a great partner with us. Whenever he wants to come back, we're ready for him. And then later on, he says, but he'll be back. We have more stuff planned. Now, we had heard that. I, we, there'd been rumors about that he's going to have a little bit more of an imprint on the actual DC universe as a whole. Um, now this kind of backs that up a little bit. You have um, Hamada saying, yeah, he's we have some more stuff planned. So I don't know if it's just Peacemaker. I don't know because I have I threw this out there on um, Twitter yesterday that maybe the future of the Suicide Squad is going to be on HBO Max and we're going to get more stories told there. Um, I don't know, but I think it's a good thing that uh, he sticks around and sticks in this universe because, like you said, we loved his film, the first film we got mm-hmm. from him there. And I think he just has a really good mind for comic book material. Yeah, so. you know, uh, you know, Hamada's the boss. I mean, he would know better than anybody, right? I'm sure they want him back. I think they, they like all the uh, critical acclaim this movie has been getting. Um, yes. Regardless of whatever you want to say about the box office, I think uh, critically this movie is uh, is has done very well, and I think that is uh, I think that's a big priority for them. I think you know, considering a lot of their movies have not done critically while making a lot of money, right? 
So um, I'm excited. I would. Uh, we do know that Gunn was offered Superman. He turned it down in favor of this. So it seems right. that he gets to pick what he wants to do, and I think that's <laughs> fine. You know, and uh, we have this Peacemaker show coming up, and who knows? Maybe we get a. Uh, maybe there's maybe maybe there's more Suicide Squad stuff coming. Maybe there's a, a Rat Catcher show or. What if there's, I don't know, a, a cool King Shark type thing? Who knows? Maybe there's a King Shark animated movie or something coming or, or TV show. I, I, who knows? Let's let's get that King Shark and TDK TV show. <laughs> you know, and King Shark was great in Harley Quinn too. So it's not like that yeah. character can work in that medium. So oh, he's awesome in Harley Quinn. Yeah. So, so it, it's it's it, it, I'm all for it. I love James Gunn. I, you know, we, we've this has been a, a James Gunn episode. Yeah. And if, you know, whatever, if, if he wants to come back and say, Hey, I want booster gold, give it to him. If he wants to do a kite man movie. All right, let's do it. If you know, I, I don't even know, like whatever character he wants, like if he wants to do a teen Titans movie, like, all right, let's go. Like I, that would be cool. Yeah. I mean, you know, he cool. seems to really kind of grasp outcast characters, broken characters, characters who have been cast off from society. So, you know, maybe somebody, uh, like a Superboy, or maybe like a coming of age Supergirl movie. Like she had, she had some growing pains, and so like, well, we'll, we'll right. and get that because Andy's doing it. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, bringing her in. So, or I mean, he could direct the spinoff. I don't know. Right. Um, so yeah, like I, I'm all for whatever he wants to do. Um, I will, you know, if it's an obscure character, I'll support it because that's great. Because I never thought I would get two Suicide Squad movies, much less one, and one featuring Starro for crying out loud. So, you know, just, you know, whatever James is up to, I'm all for, that's it. Like, just whatever he wants. I agree with you. He's, he's And that goes for both companies, too. Like, if he wants yeah. to do some crazy Marvel movie that's not Guardians, or if they want him to direct the next Avengers, I mean, I'm all for it. That would be interesting. I would, it'd be interesting to see him do something a little bit off of his wheelhouse like out of his wheelhouse almost more tame yeah i would be interesting to see that i think because i honestly think he just has a brilliant mind for this stuff i don't think he'd have a hard time going that direction he's got a just great twisted way of doing things so but yeah i think that would be interesting especially if you if you think ahead to what the next avengers film could be yeah i i think he's someone who could handle it very very well yeah so all right sticking in comic land but not in one of not really in one of the two major houses we got word and ryan lauer is gonna going to love this we got word last week that colin yost and brother casey yost from snl are going to be writing a new teenage mutant ninja turtles film at paramount now as we know the last two installments the live action installments were not received the greatest um, I like them enough. I don't think they're as terrible as people say, but I, I can't get through the second one. Yeah, I, I didn't love um, Rocksteady and Bebop too much in that. Uh, but, you know, I'm also 44 years old, so maybe that's why. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so, yeah, so we're getting this. Obviously, Yost, the Yost brothers are from SNL, so they're known for their comedy. Mm -hmm. um, one that maybe lends more to a more comedic style for the Teenage Mutant Ninja mutant ninja turtles which was kind of what how the cartoon was the original cartoon was yeah um so what do you think the original Pete? book um i like colin yost i loved him in tom and jerry i yeah. think he's hysterical i love him on saturday Night live i did not know he writes his material i did not know he was a writer for saturday Night live so i'm happy he has writing experience um i think he is someone i believe he's around our age or maybe more my age more your age so <laughs> I think that this is a guy who really loves these characters and I'm willing to give him a shot. And I, I look forward to seeing what they do. I, th I hope they learn from the mistakes of the, the nostrils and lips turtles of Michael Bay. <laughs> While I don't hate the first movie, there's certain things I do like about it, but the design isn't my favorite. I wish they went a little bit more traditional. Um, well, that's a Michael Bay thing. He did it with Transformers too. So I guess he just, yeah, know. but I mean, like it's also been proven that you could use, uh, people in suits like you know like jim henson oh, yeah. and guys did a fantastic job even in turtles 3 which is a horrible movie the turtles themselves look phenomenal um I, i'm excited for this uh, i i'm i will always support a ninja turtle uh endeavor um even the latest cartoons aren't my favorite you know but I, i've given them a chance uh i will always go back to the classic episodes of the of the cartoon that i grew up with whoa 
that's a storm. I hear that. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And uh, even the leader, I think there was like a 2000s one that was pretty serious, an animated show. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm all for it. I think it's time. I, I would, I, I kind of hope in, this is just me being a fan. I wouldn't mind smaller turtles. And that's even smaller than what we got from the Jim Henson guys. Because in the, in the cartoon, they were, you know, they weren't like six foot two tur- turtles. They were more kind of right. in between four and four, maybe five feet, something like that. Right. But uh, that's just me. But like, you know, I, I will wait and see what they come up with. But overall, this is good news for me because I'm a big fan of uh, the writer. Yeah, I'm a big fan of their um, the writers as well. I was kind of hoping the next um, TMNT film would be closer to the more brutal comic origins of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was kind of hoping we'd get something like that because I think that's something we haven't seen before. And I think it would I don't be- need an origin story for the turtle. I, I, I don't just need- want you know, a turtle movie. Yeah, I don't need the origins. I just would kind of like to see that brand with the with this IP. We probably will never get it because that's not the one that people love. So we're probably not going to get that. Uh, that first turtle movie is very faithful to it. I think I think people do love that though. Yeah, that's fair. The first that's turtle fair. movie is like the first six issues of the comic where they just ripped. They just they just took the first six comics and just basically it's lighter though. Goals. It's kind of lighter. Like the, first, the second one is, I don't remember the first one. The first one's not that light. It's I guess. It's pretty heavy. I don't know. I, I, I mean, the, the themes in it and everything that happens with Splinter, yes, you're right. It's, it's, it's a heavy, it's, it's got heavy content. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. I guess I'm thinking more brutal ninja style stuff in my head. That's why. So, but I'm looking forward to this actually because, um, I just like these. They were kind of towards the end of my interest in this stuff as a kid. They came mm-hmm. along. Excuse me. They came along a little bit after I was when I was kind of growing out, I guess, of this stuff as a kid. But um, I've always loved the characters, and I I I go see. I saw both those the movies, the Michael Bay ones in the theater. So I would definitely yeah. go see this and give it a shot. I didn't see the second one. I saw the first one, and I did enjoy it. The second one I caught on 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 Blu-ray, and I just. Yeah, not. <laughs> it's it, it's I I could, it's silly. I, I've heard some people say the second one's much better than the first, but I was like, I can't even finish it. I have two, and yeah, I don't know what they're talking about. Like to me, that's crazy talk. I, <laughs> I don't see it at all. All right, so switching gears a little bit, uh, Kevin Smith has kind of had a hot summer, right? The hot, depending on how you look at it, I guess. But obviously, the Master of the Universe show on Netflix came out controversial, we could say for some people. But I think most people at least thought it was well made. So you could say that. But Kevin Smith is known really for his cult films, right? Mall Rats, Clerks. The first um, actual shared universe. Yeah. <laughs> the USB universe. So he's known for that. Clerks was obviously a huge hit for him back in the day. And now we had Clerks 2, which I didn't like, but I know a lot of people oh, do like it. I Clerks 2, really. But we are getting a Clerks 3. Um, I can't so, get enough Dante and Randall. So just, yeah, like all for it. Like I'm a, <laughs> I'm a huge fan of uh, Clerks too. I, I I do like Clerks two more than Clerks one uh, actually, and a lot of people don't agree with that. But I, I I really do dig it. Um, I like his his movies. Um, the only one I haven't seen is Jersey Girl, and I think that's because everyone says it's horrible. It is bad. Um, but you know, I love Mall <laughs> Rats, and you know, I, you know, I, I'll always support a guy from Jersey. So, you know, me and Kevin yeah. Smith, we, we've got a lot in common. Yes. And, uh, you know, I, I'm excited for this because it, I think they're just fun movie, everyman movies. You know, it, yeah, it's just about and- normal people doing kind of, yeah, they're kind of silly. But again, it's, it's normal people living normal lives, I feel. The synopsis that they give is kind of um, close, obviously is close to him because it, it starts with following a massive heart attack. And as everyone knows, he had a heart attack. Mm-hmm. Uh, not that long ago. to his weight loss. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to this. I, even though, like I said, I didn't like to that much. I, I will always watch his movies cause they usually, I usually do enjoy them in some form or fashion. So I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I just like that. He's making things again. That's all. So, yeah, me too. I'm a, I'm a fan of Kevin Smith and I, I, I even his comic stuff, you know, like he's got his hand in a little bit of everything and, the last time we saw him, he was uh, at the red carpet premiere of Zack Snyder's Justice League. So I'm excited that yes. he's behind the camera. 
instead of in front of it. And uh, I'm excited to see what he has in store. And I can't wait to see the quick stop again. Yep. I agree with you there. So now switching gears even more, uh, I'm obviously I'm a teenager of the nineties and uh, during the nineties, there were no two bigger rappers than Biggie Smalls or Notorious B.I.G. and Tupac Shakur. As we all know, their lives came to tragic ends when they were shot and just when their careers were starting to take off. And there seems to have been numerous documentaries and stories. There was even a show on TNT, I believe, that went into the fact of the investigation into their murders and the fact that they still have not been solved. So there's a new documentary coming out from Nick Broomfield called Last Man Standing. It also includes the angle of Suge Knight in the in um in the Suge Knight's role, sorry, in the murders. And it point it sets a point of finger at the culpability of the LAPD in the death of Biggie. Which has always um, been speculated. Like this is nothing like new and groundbreaking. Right. But it, the fact that Suge went to prison, a lot of people seem to be speaking up right now. Yeah. So I think um again, I've watched every single one of these things that's come out about them, I've watched. Uh, to me, it's a lot of the same thing, but I will watch this again because, as I said, this is also his second Biggie and Tupac documentary. He came out with one in 2002. So kind of think of this like a sequel. Yeah, I saw that one. He also directed That's... Kurt and Courtney, which I love a lot. That's a Kurt Cobain, Courtney love documentary. Oh, I didn't see that, but I'll watch that. So I've seen a few of his his stuff and uh, I like them. I think they're pretty good. So I did, I did watch the 2002 one and I can't remember every time I watch a documentary, I try and say, okay, what's really, what's the motivation of the filmmaker? Like, why is he doing this? Um, most of the time you come to a thing like, oh, he was just fascinated by the story and he just wanted to get Mm -hmm. investigated further. Um, but sometimes there's more, there's a personal investment in it too. So I don't know what to to see here, but, um, obviously I am going to watch this. I'm sure you will too. Uh, there's a trailer guys. Yeah. If you want to see it again, it's called last, last man standing Suge Knight and the murders of Biggie and Tupac. So you guys want to check that out. Uh, if you want to read the article about it too, this, we got this from deadline, not deadline. So it's fascinating it to me. I, I love documentaries. I love a good murder mystery. Um, so this is right up my alley. Uh, I love that type of stuff. Um, and to involve, you know, two, two people who, you know, were a big part of my childhood at a young age, you know, Biggie and Tupac were, you know, I was at the at the early stages of hip hop when, uh, when Biggie Smalls and Tupac were killed in 96, 97, if I'm not mistaken. So, uh, you know, I, I, I've been trying to soak up as much information in, in this and, you know, it, it's, I just, I watched that trailer and I just, again, my heart just goes out to the Shakur family and Miss Wallace. I just, you know, they, they were just too young and uh, it's, it's, it's a huge bummer because I think they had so much more music to give. And, you know, Tupac was a pretty good actor in his own right. You know, he was doing other things. He was kind of like, I don't know, the LL Cool J before LL Cool J, right? He was doing music, or even Will Smith. You know, I feel like he was doing music and movies and stuff. They all came around the same time, yeah. But he did he did Juice when he was really yeah. young. So Yeah. So, you know, I, I, Tupac was an amazing, an amazing creative person. Oh, yes. And, you know, he he just got caught up in the wrong circles. And, you know, a lot of those guys in those early days of hip hop did, you know, there was a lot of territoriality, East coast, West coast stuff, you know, like, yeah, you, know, you, you, you just, it was, it was the MTV awards or something like that. You know, the, produces all up into videos, you know, Shug's the source, always talking, the source awards, source awards. Source awards. Yeah. So, you know, Shug's always talking junk and, you know, there's always, you know, Shug Knight is a very interesting person. So the more I, I learned about him and, you know, <laughs> I'm sure Rip Van Winkle is going to pop up in the documentary at some point. That story <laughs> always pops up in his Shug Knight story. So they, always, yeah, they always seem to get him in. Yeah. And we know uh, he needs, but we know Vanilla needs the check. I think actually, I don't think he does. I, I, I think, think he's he needs like the check, dude. He's been doing reality TV. <laughs> yeah. No. And he also, he like, he be he came really big in like real estate or something. I forget. Yeah, he's been like, but I think he's like a flip. I think he has. That's I think that's the reality TV thing. I think he flips houses and he does a show about it, and he's got bleached hair. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, it, it it is very three very fascinating people, and you know, if Suge Knight is this just schemer who ended up taking them both out, it's it would be interesting to have the truth come to light if that's actually what happened, and if it's not. 
you know, I know Suge's done some horrible things, but, you know, to clear your name of something as horrible as this is a good thing if, if that's what happens. So I'm like I said, this I was a teenager when they were popular and I was in college when they were killed. So I remember this story as like happened yesterday, like everything yeah, about the East Coast, West Coast. Watching. Yeah, the East West Coast stuff and. Um, there's been so much done on it and so much done on them that uh, it's still fascinating to me that these murders have not been solved. Like, it's just that part of it will always sit there until something happens. And there's a large group of people that don't think so, Tupac's actually dead. Like, there's still people. Oh, out yeah, there. I know. I know. The whole tie into the Machiavelli album and wh- who Machiavelli was. And mm-hmm. yeah, there's a lot of that stuff that goes around. Uh <laughs> I, I will say it was cool when I think it was like Snoop brought him up to Coachella, that virtual reality yep. thing. I thought that was cool. But people still think Elvis is alive too, right? So I, does know. Bill think Elvis is still alive? I don't know. Though. We should ask him. We should ask Bill. We should ask Bill if, if Elvis is alive. <laughs> He's never said it though, so I'm assuming not, but I don't Very know. True. So guys, if you are a, if you're my age and you are a hip hop fan, this is something you guys should definitely watch. I would definitely recommend you guys when it comes out, definitely get into it. If you're a fan of hip hop and you know the stories you want to watch, obviously this is another, another entry into this long um, tale. I hate to call it a tale because it sounds like it's like some kind of, but it really has become this long ongoing investigative tale that just keeps happening and people keep investigating and not finding anything. So I don't know, but what do they call them? Cold cases. Yeah, but they just kind of, they don't lead anywhere. Yeah. But people know more than they're saying, obviously. And that's to me, that's always been the, the sad well, the part. The LAPD has always been accused of being crooked. For yeah. A long time. Long. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's nothing new. <laughs> and that poor guy, um, Russell Poole, man, that guy was so close so many times and for some reason he was shut up. Like they shut him down. So who knows? Yeah, which just adds to speculation. Yep. So deaf guys definitely look out for that. All right. I think we've hit there's, our marker. There's, no, there's one more. We got one more. Oh, sorry. The Venom 2 trailer. Actually, See, there's I'm gonna, two more. Then. I'm going to let you talk about the Venom 2 trailer. Uh, well, you don't, you're not getting out of this one, kid. I, <laughs> I, I dug this, man. I was all about it. Like, it's I'm gonna I'm gonna. It's really weird. The the humor in this movie, I think, is perfect. Actually, I, it, it sits better with me than the 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 stupidity humor of the MCU, and it I think it's better for me than the over the top, just ridiculous, dick pic, uh, vulgarity humor of the suicide squad and James Gunn. Like, I feel like it's like the perfect balance of those two. Um, whether the, it works in the movie, I don't know, but like just to see Woody Harrelson kind of like try to channel his natural born killers. <laughs> it, it's, it's, I liked it. And there's the nods to the daily bugle. And I just, I, I, I think I found a nod to Beverly Hills cop. Like he's wearing a, a Detroit lions jacket, Tom Hardy. Mm-hmm. I thought that yeah. was really cool. I just noticed that today. Um, I really surprisingly like Venom 1. It's so 90s CBM to me where it's like the studio's like, source material, we don't need it. We can do this better. But like it works. It's not great. It's not really good. But like I enjoy it. Um, So I'm interested to see where this goes. And I think Carnage looks great. I still am not a huge fan of just the kind of the cowardly Venom. It doesn't mm-hmm. seem like where he's like, oh, it's a red one. I can't go after him. And he's like, oh, let's eat people. He's like, all right, let's go. Like, it's just, it's so weird. Yeah, kind of King Shark. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I, well, no, I think this Venom has a little bit more brains than King Shark. Oh, yes. Um, but like, I dig it. And, I, you know, I'm interested to see how Alfred directs this movie. <laughs> you know, I think this is Andy Serkis's directorial debut. I could be wrong. So please make sure to call me out on Twitter if I am. Um. And, I, you know, again, just seeing where this Spider-Man list, Spider-Man universe goes is is really interesting to me. So I'm all in for Venom 2. If anything, it just looks like straight up fun. Sure, it's kind of the same as the last one. You got one blob fighting another blob, but whatever, that's Venom. 
Okay, I didn't really want to talk this about where, this. Uh, Cisco and Holzman kinda, comes out. I was going to kind of fast forward past this part, but since it's there, we should talk about it. Um, I famously have said many times I do not like the first film. Um, I don't mind Venom, actually, the symbiote himself, because he's actually entertaining. So that part of it I will give him. Mm-hmm. In this, that worked for me still because I kind of like that fight between Eddie and Venom and they got like a cool odd couple thing right like them, that right? part i that from the first film i liked like that stuff always worked for me but in the trailer when he's like i'll break your nose then i'm gonna fix it and i'll break it again like, yeah like I lost it there but i don't know man it's just this movie seems so hollow like the trailer's hollow the first film was hollow i just i don't i don't it just does nothing for me and I trust me because it seems like there's a lot like Harvey seems to really love this character, so it seems like he put a lot of heart and soul in it, and he's even got, he even did some of the writing, so. Yeah, but it, I feel it's all surface level writing. Like, that's my big issue with it. I'm, I what, don't care enough about them as I should, I guess. I should care more about them, and I don't. To me, they're just, it's like watching clowns at a circus. What like, is I just, surface level writing? Tell me what that means. Hmm? What, for, for an idiot like myself, what is surface <laughs> level writing? Not deep enough? So, I mean... I, I, I guess is I mean this doesn't this isn't that type of movie though like clearly like you want like Jonathan Nolan to come in here and get real no deep. I don't it doesn't have to be like a deep like film where you get all emotional and stuff but to me everything on this movie is just on the surface there's nothing I feel like even Carnage and I love Woody Harrelson I did not like him I do not like him in this role. From what I've I seen think so he looks far. better than those pictures they released like a year ago. He whatever. does look better than the pictures, yes. So I, I don't but know if that was reshoots. Anything, the first movie who never got in reshoots announced. <laughs> yeah. I guess the best way I could say this is to me, this is kind of like the the Godzilla and Kong movies, where I love the big parts and the action stuff between the monsters, but I don't really care much about the story other than that. Okay. So I guess I can, that's the I best can, way I can, I can explain it. I'll go see it because again, it's a comic book movie and I like, I like comic book movies. I like comic books. I do like the character of Venom. So I will go see it. But, um, I did not like the trailer. The trailer didn't, this trailer did not move the needle for me at all. I will see this. I left the theater viewing of Venom, not liking it at all and pretty much hating it. And then I ended up buying it for my brother for Christmas on Blu-ray because he never saw it. And I haven't been able to stop watching it. Like it, it's weird how the repeat viewings, the movie gets better for me. And I, I don't really know why. Cause I remember like the first time I remember I went with my ex-girlfriend and she was like, you didn't like this. Did you? I was like, no, this movie sucks. But like I kept watching it and I started to enjoy it more for just what it is. Cause I get hopped up that there's no Peter Parker. There's, you know, you Sim always Rock. do. I know that, but I've, I've, I think I've evolved as a comic book movie <laughs> human being over the past few years. I think I've learned a lot from BVS and Justice League and Twitter. I think I have, you know, and me come into Sorry. my own and, 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 and who? Oh, and Bill. Yes, Bill. I've learned a lot from Bill. <laughs> and it's, you know, I've kind of lightened up a little bit. I've been, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't attack the MCU Spider-Man as much as I used to, you know, it's not my favorite. I can have civil discussion about it, but you know, it's, I just really enjoyed it for what it was, to be honest, as, as I've viewed it multiple times. I mean, I love Tom Hardy as an actor and I love Michelle Williams as an actress. I think they're both excellent. They've Mm -hmm. done excellent work in their careers. I guess that's part, maybe that's part of it too. Maybe I'm expecting more because the talent is capable of it. Oh, it's clearly not his best movie. That, it's well, that's what I mean. Like maybe I'm expecting more. It's, like I said, it's all about expectations, right? But no I do what think we do, he's having the most fun on this movie. I, think I agree with that. I think he's having a with blast that. with this role because this isn't typical Eddie Brock either. Yeah, you know, he's no, kinda it's not. Created, he's kind of created his own interpretation, and it's 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 very fresh. It's not like anything. It's not like Ultimate Eddie. It's not like mainstream Six One Six Eddie. So it you know, and I I applaud that, and this. You know, like Tom Hardy just loves his 90s hulking villains. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm all in for Venom, too. I just I can't wait to see, see this movie. And a lot of it has to do with Woody. Like, I like when Woody goes insane. Well, I, again, I'm going to watch it. I hope I like it more. 
uh, my, but my expectations are not high. So that's it. That's my reaction to the trailer. My expectations aren't high, but I think I will enjoy it. Okay. And we got another trailer you did remind me of. We did have another trailer that came out, a sports-related trailer. So we're going back. We're coming full circle now. We started with sports and we're ending with sports. So as if you're a basketball fan, everybody knows, an NBA basketball fan specifically, everyone remembers the malice in the palace, the fight at the Palace of Auburn Hills between Ron Artest and fans. That's pretty much what it was. Now he's Meta World Peace or something else. I don't know. He changes his name all the time. Cool inside fact, I went to, I had two classes with Ron Artest when I was at St. John's. But anyway, let's continue. Let's keep going forward. Um, so the trailer came out. Netflix is doing a documentary about uh, the Malice in the Palace. And uh, if you guys want to check out the trailer, you can just search for it on YouTube. It's everywhere. Uh, I know the story because I remember reading about it. And I was actually, I actually did a piece on, on it years ago when it happened. But um, I'm looking forward to this. I want to see the firsthand accounts from the people who were there. And that seems like that's exactly what they're giving us. So I did, I don't remember. It's funny to see Reggie Miller in the trailer, though, because like he was there, but he wasn't really involved. He was injured. Yeah. So it's funny seeing him. But, uh, man, seeing that scene again with, with Artez laying on the table and then just losing it. That's that was crazy to see again. So, Pete, you're an Indiana Pacers fan. So, what's your anticipation for this? There's probably nobody in this fanboy space who probably knows more about this topic than I do. Um, uh, this I remember. I remember watching this live. I mean, as you said, I'm a I'm a huge Pacer fan. Of uh, Reggie Miller it has defined my basketball life since uh, since I was a child. Uh, I was in my college dorm room. I was playing beer pong. I was hammered. And then the next thing I look up is, you know, Ron Artest is running in the, uh, in the crowd. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of like the 2001 world series for me. It, I felt like I had a championship stolen. Uh, that That's probably the greatest Pacer team that was ever assembled. They had a, a legitimate shot at an NBA championship. The Pistons were their number one contenders. So to to you know have the season and the franchise derailed ten years because of this was huge. Um, and they've almost kind of never recovered, really. You know the the Paul George, Danny Granger, Roy Hibbert era was about as close as they got. Mm-hmm. But those teams were just never good enough to take on LeBron. Uh, it's <laughs> I I'm really interested to see how they how they you know, show all the footage and everything. Cause I remember up in smoke is a podcast from Steven Jackson and I believe Matt, Bar- Matt Barnes and Ron yep. was on there and Ron talks about what he was doing in that moment and how the Pacers knew what he was doing. Like Ron was in therapy at the time. And when Ron was feeling a specific way, he basically would just go and give himself a timeout. And, you know, Jacko goes, well, I knew what Ron was doing. We all knew what Ron was doing. And then you hear Reggie talk about like out of the corner of my eye because Reggie's on the bench. He's on the DL. He sees this cup flying and it it hits Ron. And then, you know, the the fight ensues. And it was just a bad look for the NBA at the time. The NBA had an image problem. You know, they, you know, the, the, you know, the quote unquote thug mentality of the NBA at that time, the tattoos, the baggy jeans, the long white tees. You know, it was, you know, you don't think about it now because the NBA is kind of turned into a very geek chic, right? Like the way these guys dress is a completely 180. Like you look at LeBron's draft picture, like I've never seen baggier suits in my life. <laughs> you know, like the style is different. Yeah, so the NBA had that. the NBA really worried about their image after this. And it's just, I, I can't wait to hear everybody explain like Jackson, um, Jermaine O'Neal, one of the greatest Pacers of all time, Reggie Miller, you know, Rick Carlisle. It, it's just fascinating to me that this hasn't really been explored until now and everyone's got a part in it and they all have stepped up and spoke about it and it's just it's one of those memories where you know i i i I do feel like i was robbed of something that i may never achieve as, as a fan and that is a legitimate title contender i can relate to it in the in this way then in 1996 97 
the Knicks Heat series where Charlie Ward and PJ Brown got into a fight. Yeah. And then I can relate from a from a fan standpoint as to I feel like I got robbed from something. That's my relation. What I can't relate to for you um is watching something like this as a fan of the team when one of your players is going into the stands to fight a, a fan who threw beer on him. Now again, and got the wrong guy. Right. Like that from that standpoint, I don't, I can't relate to. So I remember when it happened and I, I knew the season was over. Like you just look at that yep, and you just, you, there's no recovering from that. Cause I think Reggie got like 10 games and he was on the DL and all he was doing was pulling people off. Right. He each other. Of- Meanwhile, J- Steve Jackson is in, in the stands fighting people. Jermaine O'Neal punched that fat kid and he fell to the face like with a sliding punch. It's, I think uh, David Harrison, he, he, he was, he was clocking people left and right. It, I I've never seen, we've never seen anything like that because I don't think we, we've seen fights. We've seen baseball brawls, right? Um, there's the infamous, Oh my God, what's the baseball thing where the guy attacked the other guy with the bat. I can't remember. Um, it's it's an old. I think it involved the San, the New York Giants or something like that. You're right. I can't recall, but I can't I, remember. I, can't I can remember see the, the footage involved. in my head. Yeah. But we've never seen, you know. And then the the closest I think we've ever gotten to is when that fan uh, fell on top of Ty Domi in the penalty box in Philadelphia. But that was like two guys. Yeah. You're literally having you're literally having a battle. It, it's it, this was like a ba- WWF battle royale in the Palace of Walmer Hills, and you know it, it's. You look at it, and the person it most affected in my in my eyes, I, I it's it's Reggie Miller. Reggie never again was able to get as close as he was to a championship. He was at the tail end of his career. He too, was at the so. end of his career, and he yeah. never resigned with the Celtics, even though Danny Ainge begged him to come back. You know, and you know it's it's just it's a sad moment in sports history, and you know it made a lot of people question you know alcohol sales and stuff like that, and there was a huge to do and people went to court, you know, like <laughs> those. Yeah. I mean, it was, court, it was like, serious. It was a serious thing. And it's funny you brought up the Taidomi thing. Cause I remember one of the discussions after it happened was, well, do we need to put barriers between the fans and the court? Like that was actually discussed. Yeah. Um, so. Cause there's no more intimate seat than a court side seat. At a right. It's game. The NBA's greatest strength is that you are literally inches away from the players. You're on the, where you are. You're on the playing field. Yes, yeah. which is the is the great viewing, like the great um, spectacle part of the NBA is that you're they're literally right there. Um, so we could talk about this for hours. Maybe when it actually comes out, Pete, we'll do a show on it because it's, it's something that I remember and obviously it's very close to you. So maybe when it actually comes out and we watch it, um, we can do a little bit of a show on that. Because it, it literally is something we could talk about for hours and hours. Uh, what's happened in the NBA since then and how players are treated and so on and so forth. I'm very interested to see how Pacers Twitter interacts with that. You know, I, I, I interact with a lot of those guys and, you know, uh, Alex Golden, Glenn Richardson, Ross from the Corner 3 show. Like those guys are big time Pacer fans. And right. I think everyone's going to be really interested to see what happens. It, it's, I, I don't know about them, but like to me, I, I've kind of, blocked it from my memory it's it might be my worst sports moment ever as a fan you know like you hear about people talking about like you know i was there i mean what was it when uh, uh brett hall scored the goal in the crease or jeffrey mayer catching the the ball over tony tarasco's right. head or you know uh steroid gonzalez hitting the ball uh, the loop the looper over jeter off rivera you know you, you just and th- those moments hurt uh, but you know that's still in the heat of competition, right? right. Like that's the game. This is yep. the game being taken away because you know someone did something really dumb to someone who has anger issues. Yes, know, and, and he was battling demons. Yes. Yeah, so it was the it was the he, it was literally the worst case, the worst player that could have that could have thrown that at. And it stinks because he it. was doing his his like techniques to calm himself. Yep. He was and doing what he was, he was practicing his, his, his behaviors and he was trying to become better. And you know, you, you poke the bear and you get what you get. And Pete, if you haven't watched his Netflix run our, the one on run our test, his, I, uh, he's very interesting. I love yeah. Him. Um, but it kind of, it kind of goes into that. 
uh, a little bit more. So guys, definitely check the trailer out. If you're, especially if you're basketball and sports fans, definitely check it out. Everyone is, who's a sports fan. Even if you're not a basketball fan, you remember the malice in the palace. It was a and huge, he, he, he feels remorse for it. Like when he won that championship with the Lakers, he, he got up on the podium post game interviews and he thanked, he, he apologized to Jermaine O'Neal and Jeff Foster and Reggie Miller and all those guys who, you know, he thinks he, ro- he robbed his own team of a championship right. because of his actions. And, He's had to deal with that his whole life. So, right. yeah. So it's a fascin. It's it's gonna probably gonna be a fascinating documentary. I'm surprised it wasn't a thirty for thirty, but it's cool that it's on Netflix. So guys, definitely look out for that. I believe. What, did it say next year it was coming out, or was it September? I don't know. I should have. I remember it was I at the, the end. Biggie Tupac documentary comes out this month on the twentieth. I think this one's a year away. Okay. So there we go. All right. So let's wrap this up, Pete. So. Tell everyone where they can check you out. You can follow me on social media. That's Twitter, Instagram, and Zack Snyder's favorite viewer at Pete Illustrated. You can follow the show that you're listening to right now, Straight Outta Gotham, at straight underscore O underscore G on both Instagram and Twitter. Uh, I have a new review of Detective Comics out on Batman on Film proper. Make sure you go to the website, not the Facebook group. Got to go to the website. Um, I've got toy reviews on Batman on Film YouTube. I've got interviews with legends like Michael Uslin on Batman on Film YouTube, Tara Strong. I've got a written interview with Rich Trone. Everyone loves him, our favorite stuntman on Batman on Film proper. Check that stuff out. Italians for Spidey. Uh, check that out on Twitter, the Italian Spider-Man Coalition podcast that I co-host with Nico and his father, Nicholas Caruso. That's a fun time there. Uh, wonderful day for the Yellow Oval crew at Team Yellow Oval. Batman 89 came out. Detective 1041 has got the Yellow Oval. The Oval's back. Keaton's back. We're really excited. We're still basking in the glory. Uh, just lots of positive stuff. Make sure you buy our t-shirts on our T public store. They're getting pulled right now. Disney's on us. Warner brothers are on us. They're trying to shut us down. We're going to try to rebel. Um, but, uh, make sure you pick up some merch, help support the show, wear, wear some fly stuff. And, uh, I don't know. I think that's it. Eric, take it away. All right. As you know, you can find me on Twitter at finally 33 spell finale 33. Also on Instagram, you could check us out on Facebook. We have our Facebook page, our Facebook group. Check us out over there. Going to be posting some new content there shortly. Check me out on Batman on Film. I will be making my my journalistic return to Batman on Film starting on Friday with the release of Titan Season 3. Actually, I think it's going to be the first three episodes. I think that's what they're showing. So They're doing three I'll, at a time? I think, well, I think the first day special. is going to be three. and Yeah, I think it's just the first day is three, three and then the reviews or one long review? I'm probably going to do three separate reviews, but I haven't totally decided yet. He's so, back. The best writer in fanboy we'll journalism see. is back, everybody. <laughs> Not even close, but okay. And you're Alan Holzman. I love the I love the support, though. I love the support. Thank you. So, you guys, check me out there on Batman on Film. Uh, Pete and I, if I, well, I'm going to try and get this up. So, we will be having a special SOG Tonight episode, actually tomorrow, which will be August 11th, um, to discuss Batman 89. Uh, the comic, the comic book. book, not the movie. The comic right. book, the comic book, and I'm sure we'll discuss we'll, how it relates we'll, to the we'll film. Like we'll we'll do, we'll do. A, I'm sure a larger... we'll talk all things Burton Batman at that at yeah. that show, and whatever other topics come into our mind while we're talking about it. I'm, I'm sure. So. There, I'm sure there's something on Twitter that's pissing everybody off. Yeah, or yeah, it'll, or it'll happen tomorrow, and we'll talk about it then. So definitely look at look out for that live. If you guys miss it, obviously it'll be on YouTube. It'll be on Facebook Live. So check us out over there, um, if you miss it. And I think that's all I have for right now. So anything oh, wait, else? One Pete? more thing. One more thing. Oops. <laughs> I still don't know why he does that, but okay. <laughs> all right, Pete. So, <laughs> so for Peter Vera, I am Eric Colesman. You are listening to straight out of Gotham and we'll see you next time. Booyah. <laughs>